Mark, we are sitting in our bureau's green room, seven floors up. It's a rare day where actually, touch wood, it's been quite quiet today. <laughs> Best one in a while. Yeah, we're looking out in a busy uh, US capital, Union Station, far beneath us. Martha, you're in LA, where you're based. Yeah, you're on the beach, I presume, yeah? Sitting on my deck chair, mojito in hand, surrounded by various celebrities. It's how we picture you. <laughs> I'm actually at home in my cardigan, just excited to, to get this podcast underway. And I do have an acai protein smoothie in my hand, so there is a little sprinkling of LA here. How very Los Angeles indeed. <laughs> Hello, welcome to USA 2024 On The Road. I'm Martha Kellner in Los Angeles. I'm Mark Stone in Washington, D.C. And I'm James Matthews. I'm also in the U.S. Capitol. All three of Sky's U.S. correspondents together for this week's podcast. On the road, as we cover America's election now less than 50 days away. 1.30 this afternoon. Call came out, shots fired. That was called. Questions will now be asked as to whether Donald Trump was targeted. I think this is a different kind of a race. All we have to do is define our opponent as being a communist or a socialist or somebody that's. What is the greatest national security threat to the United States? It's Donald Trump. But some crazy person is going to take matters into their own hands and actually listen to the crazy rhetoric that you're putting out there. We've had a a busy week. Uh, It saw a second apparent assassination attempt, of course on Donald Trump. And Martha, you're just back from seeing him in Michigan, yeah? Yeah, just got back uh, yesterday evening, actually, uh, was in the city of Flint, Michigan. This was Donald Trump's first public appearance since that second uh, attempt at assassination. So really, it was just interesting to get a sense of what he looked like, how he interacted with the crowd inside that arena. And crucially, I think sort of the question that we're all asking is how might this assassination attempt and the previous assassination attempt affect this election race. It's a very serious subject, clearly, but uh, your reporting includes, it says here, hot dog gate. Is that right? (laughs) I like that it's already got a name. Yeah, serious drama (laughs) at the concession stand uh, at that rally. (laughs) Well, can't wait to hear what that's about. My part in our coverage was to look into the would-be assassin. He did live in North Carolina before that. That's where... I had AIDS, and I'll tell you about our trip there. But first, Mark, it was Sunday. You got the call to go to Florida when this incident happened. Yeah, and it was on Sunday when I was on the touchline of my kids' football, and I saw a um, a message come in from Stephen Chung, who's the uh, communications guy for Donald Trump, and it just said, shots fired uh, on the golf course. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And... Within a matter of minutes, uh, I was being asked by the desk to do a phono onto our our news channel. Uh, That meant just ringing up and being on air. But I was on on the (laughs) touchline. Kids still playing football, me on the phone to London, trying to ascertain what had happened. All very chaotic. Long story short, managed to get kids deposited at the neighbor's house, dog back at home, and then straight to the airport, down to West Palm Beach. And one feature of America and the American authorities is when something like this happens, they get the information out there. And over time, we learned about what had happened in the bushes by this golf course. Yeah, I I always enjoy an American uh, news conference like that because they have someone from every different department all lined up and they all do their bit. We are going to give you, when I say we, we have a representative from the FBI, from the Secret Service, from the state attorney's office. We are going to give you everything we have. All right. I got the sense the sheriff was kind of enjoying the moment because for him, he was at the centre of it. He was the man whose troopers had arrested uh, this alleged gunman 40 miles up the road from the golf course uh, in what was a high-speed chase. And, yeah, in the news conference, we learned quite a bit initially. Call came out, shots fired. That was called in by the Secret Service. Because we're in constant contact with them all the time, we were notified of that. And we had units here that immediately sealed off the area. Now, in the bushes where this guy was is a 8K-47 style rifle with a scope, two backpacks which were hung on the fence that had a ceramic tile in them, and a GoPro, which he was going to take pictures of. So those are being processed. That was the beginning of, of a process of learning more over the subsequent 24 hours about who this man was. One thing that's always baffled me about Mar-a-Lago is that he talks about it being this amazing resort, but it's underneath the flight path, as you can hear. 
maybe when he bought the place, um, the flight path was different. Anyway. After about 24 hours reporting at the golf course, we moved to Mar-a-Lago. That was where Donald Trump was. It was the best location for us to be at. Well, I'm back at Mar-a-Lago after having not been for maybe six, eight months or so. Uh, and the first thing that, that's really clear is that the security has been upped here um, quite substantially. Uh, there are Secret Service security towers, two big white towers, sort of temporary things that uh, may well become pretty permanent, uh, situated just inside the grounds. There is a boat with a machine gun mounted on the front, uh, just on the water, two police cars uh, stationary on the bridge that leads over to Mar-a-Lago, uh, and a couple of checkpoints as well at the blocks further back as you're approaching West Palm Beach, which is an island uh, off the main Palm Beach area. So there's a lot of security here, and the um, Secret Service said that they believe that there is a hypersensitive security environment uh, that they're having to deal with at the moment. While you were doing that at Mar-a-Lago, Mark, I was heading to North Carolina. We had a, a name for the suspect behind this apparent assassination attempt. The authorities using that word apparent. Uh, the name was Ryan Ruth. So we set off for Greensboro, North Carolina, a four and a half hour drive. Thank you, thank you. That's what our bureau chief, Emily Purser-Brown, the car basically is a mobile office in these situations. We had an address for Ryan Ruth and for his son in Greensboro. When we got there, the aim was to see what information he or neighbours might provide. Who is this man? What's his background? What was his motivation? It's all part of the big picture. We're trying to get a couple more of him, what looks like Ukraine, or like looking sort of military in that well, This story, as with so many these days, the primary source of information is online. As we made our way to North Carolina, we were seeing video of Ryan Ruth giving interviews in Ukraine. He wanted to fight, but the Ukrainians had rejected him. He was too old, lacked war experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed in the international civilian response to this Then he crisis. styled himself as a recruiter of soldiers. I had anticipated that thousands of civilians from every country around the world would have flocked here to support the Ukrainians. So, you know, we're sifting through that, asking, is that a clue? Is he somebody unhappy with Trump's stance with regard to the Ukraine-Russia war? You know, we've got, to, we've got to use that tweet about him voting for Trump because he's obviously voted for him and become disaffected. Yeah. Um, Ryan Ruth, he seems to have been an erratic individual. He had a criminal record. At one point, he held police at bay in an armed standoff. Looking at his tweets, he'd been a supporter of Donald Trump. He evidently grew disillusioned with him. And in April, he wrote, democracy is on the ballot we cannot lose. In the rain of Greensboro, there was no sign of any relatives or friends of Ryan Ruth, not that we could find anyway. Part of our report was gauging reaction. We spoke to some people in the town. You know, Donald Trump, uh, there was an, another assassination attempt. Do you think that changes anything? I don't think it's changed anything. I just think people are just used to it. They're just used to him. Look, I used to hate Donald Trump. I've changed my thoughts on him. Um, I think he's for the people. I think he's going to fix this country. I think we absolutely need him to save this country. Kamala and Biden haven't done nothing but the border crisis, um, inflation. They've ruined the economy. They've ruined this country. And we need Trump. And that's my opinion. What do you think of the fact that there's been a second attempt? I think it's scary. I think it's scary. You know, we live in a crazy world. I don't know. The first time it happened, I thought, well, he's won now. I thought the election was over, and they switched candidates, and it seems to be going the other way now. I, it seems like it won't matter as much now, I don't think. Yeah, what do you think, first of all, of the fact that there's been this assassination attempt? What do I think about it? Um, personally, I think any attempt on anybody's life is kind of sad, but at the same time, I think it's a... I think it's a ploy. I think it's a tactic to get people to like talk about, you know, politics and get people to care. So that's genuinely what I think it is. A tactic by whom? The one and only Trump. Why would they do that? Bad publicity, good publicity, all publicity is publicity. Thank you. I I was not ready for that, but I yeah. tried my. So the full story remains to be told. I think there's every chance that 
that story will come from Ryan Ruth himself. He's a man who's never been shy about his views or sharing his opinions online, certainly. Now, Mark, we were both on the news that night. And of course, by that time, we're talking about Monday evening, uh, you had more information released by the authorities. Yeah, uh, we had the body cam footage. I mean, America, perhaps more than any other country, all law enforcement are always wearing body cameras and, and, and you get this video very, very quickly. Take two steps to your right! And it was dramatic. It showed law enforcement, as they call them, from different units approaching a man who was asked to walk backwards uh, with his T-shirt up so they could check that there was nothing, no weapons around his waist or anything. And then they took him into custody. A dramatic 30 seconds or so, which obviously was the, the top bid for our, our news report uh, that evening. But what it also showed was what the sheriff had told us earlier, which was that the most remarkable thing about the arrest was how unremarkable it was. Ruth complied with them. He was very relaxed. He was nonchalant. He'd been charged with two gun-related crimes, one for obliterating the serial number on the gun, uh, another for having a gun when he was already a convicted felon, as, as you've discussed. Uh, so we were building a greater picture at our end, as you were in Greensboro, uh, about who this guy was, and, and clearly a very complex character, uh, for sure. Uh, but interestingly, a clearer political view than the other a man who tried to assassinate Donald Trump uh, a few months earlier. It was clear enough, certainly to those on Trump's side, that he was anti-Trump, that he was a Democrat, for them to be able to start some quite active political attacks against uh, the left and against the Democrats. This is your fault. Biden, Harris, Walls, this is your fault for saying that Trump is the threat to democracy. And of course, you're in Mar-a-Lago and you're looking, you're waiting for Donald Trump. We are, and, and we were hoping that we might get some sort of statement from him um, down in Florida. But then news that he was going to go to a rally in Flint, Michigan. Uh, and so we saw the motorcade leaving. He's always away from us. Right. I pointed out the truck, that's where he is. Oh. <laughs> Did you see him? Oh, yeah. I see him. Trump 24, baby! Welcome back to USA 2024 On The Road with Martha Kellner, Mark Stone and me, James Matthews. You've heard from Mark and me about our coverage around the Trump apparent assassination attempt. Martha, you made the journey to Michigan this week. Just in the familiar routine of uh, going through security at LAX, this time for a flight to Detroit, and then it will be onwards to Flint, Michigan, for Trump's town hall. So just going through the scanners now. Yeah, a town hall, which is uh, in the US, a forum where a politician agrees to a question and answer with members of the public. But in truth, this felt more like a rally for Donald Trump with his diehard fans there. There was not a person who didn't have some form of Donald Trump or MAGA branded clothing on. Just going through the scanners at the Dort Financial Centre, uh, there's airport style scanners, sniffer dogs going through our cameraman Chris's bags. Stand up and place your hands on your heart and sing along if you know this great tune. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's And did Trump address this attempt on his life? Yeah, he spoke about it at length. In fact, that's how he opened up this, this forum. He was on stage with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, a very sympathetic questioner, uh, a former press secretary of his, now the governor of Arkansas. And he, he, opened, he opened up by saying that being a president was a dangerous business, more dangerous, he said, than being a, a car racing driver. Uh, he made a rather bombastic remark that, in his words, only consequential presidents get shot. And then he walked the audience through step by step what exactly happened when he heard those shots ringing out on that golf course between holes five and six. One of the agents was walking a couple of holes in front and he saw a rifle 
AK-47, that's serious stuff, right? You know more about that. My sons know more about this stuff. And he saw the barrel of the gun coming out from a bush. Can you believe it? This guy was all set. He was all set to do his number. And there was no talk. He didn't say, hello, what are you doing here, please? Yeah, and we've heard him calling for a dialing down of the political rhetoric before, haven't we? A lot of talk about how words may have played a part in what we've seen. Yeah, although with Donald Trump, uh, as ever, it tends to be contradictory. He wrote on his Truth Social site that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's rhetoric had, in his words, sent the bullets flying, insinuating in a way that they had had a hand, however removed, in this man's apparent decision to try and take his life. I didn't hear much of that angry, divisive rhetoric. Instead, he was gushing almost as he recalled these conversations. He had separate telephone conversations with President Biden and with Vice President Kamala Harris. And he was very complimentary, even shushing the crowd when they were trying to you know, call out insults about them. And I have to say that uh, President Biden called me yesterday. He was very nice, we had a very nice conversation. I appreciated that he called about, you know, what happened the other day. And he says, he's, he's committed. He's committed. No, but, and today, I, a little while ago, I got a, nice, a very nice call from Kamala. No. It was very nice. It was very nice. It's, it's, on that point, Martha, it did make me wonder whether someone had said to him, we've got to tone this down a bit. And, and so he, he's kind of doing different things for different audiences. But remember, a day earlier, he had had a private meeting with the acting director of the Secret Service. To be a fly on that wall, I'd love to have heard, because surely you'd imagine the Secret Service director would say to him, look, sir, we've all got to dial this down a bit, because the job for them is so hard. So maybe someone said something to him, and for a moment he did dial it down. But it, as you say, contradictory to a T. Yeah, question number one, I think, to the head of the Secret Service was whether or not he could continue to, to play golf, wasn't it? And Martha, you spoke to people at the, the rally in Michigan. What did they have to say? These were the Donald Trump diehard fans, you know, people wearing veterans for Trump T-shirts, women for Trump. Jesus is my saviour, Donald Trump is my president. These are uh, the people who doesn't have to worry uh, about voting for him. But even uh, among them, and I, I think this is something that we'll all have found from covering Donald Trump supporters across the states, they say even they would quite like him to tone down his rhetoric. He's been talking a lot about dialing down the rhetoric, about lowering the political temperature. Did you feel that tonight? Yeah, I mean, I've wanted him to do that since 2016. So, uh, yeah, there's been times when I've just like, what did he say that for? And it, so, but he, he has dialed it down quite a bit, I think. Are you concerned about the level of political violence in this country, the potential for it? Yeah, I really am. I mean, although I only I don't see any other going towards the other side. I just see it mainly coming towards him. He does seem a little calmer. He does seem a little calmer. But does he need to be a little calmer? Because he's talking about taking down the rhetoric. Do you need him to be calmer? No, we need someone that the rest of the world looks at and goes, whoa, we got to watch this. We have to step back and pay attention. Yeah. Did he say what you were looking to hear from him? Absolutely. We want industry back in Michigan. We're very worried about it from all our autumn workers. You can see them behind us. This is just incredible. He needs to save our, not just our country, of course, our state. You know, one woman almost in tears as she was telling me that she's scared for, for Donald Trump's life because she believes he's the saviour of her grandchildren. I started to cry because all I want to do is have him be safe. He needs to be our president. I'm fighting for my grandchildren so their future is safe because of him. It is not safe now for our young children or our children that are all in school. They're being taught horrible things. He's got to fight. And were they all Trump fans that you bumped into? All Trump fans inside that uh, arena. Yeah, it did really have the feel of a rally. You know, they were queuing for hours beforehand outside the arena in the baking sun. These are our people for whom he is a hero. A different picture, though, in the wider city of Flint, Michigan. 
Michigan is a swing state. This is a place where Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are desperate to win over voters. Flint's around an hour's drive north of Detroit. It's a small city, but an interesting place with a lot of issues, really. Lots of boarded up businesses and rundown houses. And people might remember it. It's the scene, and this was international news back in 2014, of a major water crisis. It was a man-made crisis where lead got into the, the drinking water and the bathing water. And more than a dozen people in Flint lost their lives, many more poisoned. And it still casts a major shadow over the place. And it was once sort of quite thriving. It was home to General Motors, which is a major car manufacturer. And it was shaped by the auto industry, but also in a way shattered by its decline. And cars are still something that people there love. And and that's the reason why we went off to um, one of the major highways running through the city, which is lined with, you know, auto repair shops, big scrapyards, garages, to try and get people to talk about the political landscape. Lots of options for car places around here. Let's try this one first. sometimes quite difficult to convince people to talk about politics because they're worried about the repercussions. These were people who were worried if they went on camera and spoke to us that they would get rocks thrown through their windows. That is a, a concern for people here, or at least that's what they're, they're telling us when you know they're rejecting our invitation. So if you guys had to rely on me for news and social media, <laughs> you'd be broke, you'd have to find another job. Next place. No. That was a no. Eventually, a nice man at Trevor's Tyres, Trevor in fact, agreed to let us into his tyre shop to speak to people. And uh, I spotted a, a woman, Kristin Martinez, almost running away from me actually, uh, but rolling a, a tyre towards her car and asked her who she'd be voting for in November. Yes. You're, vote, story. you're voting for Trump. Yes. You bet. Yeah. You know Trump. I I'm a, I'm a supporter. You mm -hmm. know, it was scary what happened with the attempt assassination, but you know, thankfully he's all right and he. I think he's thriving. Who do you think is responsible? Because he's saying that Biden and Harris's words have uh, meant the bullets are flying. I I really do think that they are responsible for. Um, you know, maybe not calling out somebody to do it, but you know, their words triggered somebody mentally and emotionally to think that this was the right thing to do. Kristen was with her friend uh, David Robinson and like many people in Flint, he said he's more worried about gas prices, supermarket prices than he is about political rhetoric at the moment. That feels like a more major concern for him. I believe Mr. Trump has his best interests at heart for people like me that have worked their whole lives away. I worked in the oil field. I'm dying of cancer. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. That's, That's... Don't be sorry. It's his life. It's what you do. Well, I am sorry. We're going to build hot rods yeah. and live good. My life was a lot better with him in the house. So. Yeah. You were better off oh, way financially? Be way better off. What's a gallon of gas cost you today? Mm -hmm. When he was in office, a buck seventy-eight for during COVID, mm -hmm. even. Are people more interested in that tier than the rhetoric and the, the debate around that? I would believe that, yeah. wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You know? Not everyone at Trevor's Tyres was a Trump fan, though. I also spoke to Gary Grundy. He was loading tyres into the back of his SUV with his friends. He is an independent voter, and he says he's going to vote for Kamala Harris this time round. But interestingly, he said that he thinks both sides need to take responsibility for the divisive political rhetoric at the moment. What, what was your reaction when you heard? I was saying that's two attempts in less than a month. That's kind of crazy, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the political discord is so high and the rhetoric is so bad right now, it's, it's not good for either. Rhetoric on both ends is responsible. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So it's not one side or the other, it's a collective responsibility. Yes, it's a collective responsibility and uh, they need to dial it down and just concentrate on the issues mm -hmm. and let's vote and the best person win and we got to support whoever wins, if it's Trump or Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. we got to support. Well, the polls are still tight. Mark, what do you think has changed in the past week, if anything? Well, I think the polls, yes, uh, they are looking good for Kamala Harris, uh, to be honest. They are still very tight, but the latest polling that's come out in the past 24 hours suggests that uh, she is ahead in almost all of the key polls uh, that are being done nationwide. It is still incredibly tight, but remember how far behind the Democrats were under Biden, uh, and they are now moving ahead uh, in some of the key battleground states, Michigan, uh, of course, among them. Yeah, I'm not sure that this will have a positive impact on the polls for Donald Trump. We saw in the aftermath of that first assassination attempt, he all of a sudden uh, was leading in all seven key swing states. But I think that was because you had that strongman image of him with his fist held aloft, which contrasted so helpfully for the Trump campaign with the image of the ailing President Biden struggling to get out of his car, struggling to get up the stairs of Air Force One. This is a different race now. So I think there will be limited impact, truly. I think people, like you say, are looking at supermarket prices, gas prices, immigration, abortion. I don't know that swing voters uh, are going to be swayed by uh, this sort of political violence. Yeah, one question, a very dark one, of course, is, you know, whether or not we might see uh, an assassination attempt again, possibly before the election. I think when you look at the reaction, you know, from opinion formers, among others, Elon Musk, among them, he posted on X before he deleted it. No one is even trying to assassinate Biden stroke Kamala. I think the political debate here this week has been about language, rhetoric, who is driving political violence. What we don't hear, sadly, is a unified effort to, to step back from it. Yeah, I was horrified when I saw that Elon Musk tweet. He obviously did delete it fairly quickly, but this is a man who has untold political influence. He has so, so many followers and to tweet something so irresponsible to so many people it's it's scary really it really is what interested me though was that yes he deleted it but then a few hours later jd vance donald trump's running mate uh, effectively said the same thing uh, in a speech it was more nuanced and he put more context around it if you tell the american people that this person is the end of democracy if you tell the american people that this person needs to be eliminated most of them thank God, are going to ignore you, but some crazy person is going to take matters into their own hands and actually listen to the crazy rhetoric that you're putting out there. And I know it's popular on a lot of corners of the left to say that we have a both sides problem. And I'm not going to say we're always perfect. I'm not going to say that conservatives always get things exactly right. But you know the big difference between conservatives and liberals is that no one has tried to kill Kamala Harris in the last couple of months. And two people now have tried to kill Donald Trump in the last couple of months. I'd say that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to to tone down the rhetoric. So what he's doing there is he's, he's essentially framing this as assassination attempt that came as a consequence of the Democratic Party rhetoric. And, and they argue, the Republicans argue, that that sort of language has led to a crazy man doing something crazy and that it will happen again. The problem, of course, is that the Democrats fundamentally believe that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy and that they think that is a legitimate political attack that they should and need to be making to warn the American people that he's a threat to democracy. But when you add into that mixture a lot of mental illness in America, massive problem, and guns, well, that's what you get. Golf yeah. course shootings. Yeah, it's the language of prejudice, division, and I suppose it shores up the voter base. But as you said earlier, Martha, in terms of speaking to people in the middle ground, swaying independent voters, you have to wonder about the value. I would say one thing. that I think it is clear that... that that a lot of people behind the scenes within the Trump bubble uh, are increasingly fed up with this sort of thing. They really want Donald Trump to focus much more on policy. They see that Kamala Harris, the opposition, is not focusing on policy. 
she really has not drilled down much on what her administration would look like, what her political ideology is. And so there is an opportunity there for Trump to do just that. And yet he and his surrogates continue with kind of light and cruel attack lines rather than focusing on policy. And someone kind of quite plugged in said to me the other day that, do you know, if Trump wasn't the candidate, the Republicans would be doing so much better. And I imagine there are some policy wonks within the Republican Party behind the scenes who are just banging their heads against the wall. Uh, now, Martha, the one thing we haven't discussed is Hot Dog Gate. You promised at the beginning you'd tell us all about it. What I will say is you do not want to see hangry MAGA fans. You also don't want to see hangry journalists. It was about two hours out from Donald Trump speaking and they have concession stands all around the arena. So I suggested to Chris, our cameraman, and Sarah, our producer, it might be a good idea to go up and get some hot dogs to keep us going for the evening. Well, nothing left. Chicken strips then? So we're standing in this queue for around 45 minutes. We're just near the front when suddenly they announce that they're only serving drinks. What did she say? Only uh, drinks. They're not serving any more food? No more food. And when I tell you there was uproar, there were people snatching bags of crisps from each other. How about chips? We're going to die out here. I thought I was going to see a punch up. I really did. And that's not to mention how annoyed uh, Chris, our cameraman, was that he wasn't getting his hot dog. And these are the people all on the same side. Exactly. More eyewitness (laughs) journalism next week. Uh, Thanks, Martha. I'm very brave. Yeah, I feel feel quite hungry now. (laughs) Uh, Many thanks for joining us on the second of our US specials, which we're broadcasting in the run-up to November's election. USA 2024 on the road, because there's the news and there's reporting the news. Thanks very much. From me, James Matthews. From me, Mark Stone. And from me, Martha Kellner. Speak, <laughs> Speak next week. <laughs> there you go, I do.